Today we're going to talk about metahuman faces, and you will see in a second what is a human metahuman face. But more importantly, we are going to talk about the relation between the fact of recognizing a face as a true face and our experience, uh, which is granted by face. So let's start by looking at the one minute trailer of metahumans, and after we will continue. Okay, so this was the trailer, the launch trailer in February 2021, so it's very recent. The beta was opened in April 2021. Uh, so as you have seen, it is a software to create amazingly realistic digital faces. Uh, what is interesting about metahuman faces, however, is the idea behind metahuman faces. So when we look at uh, one of the main creators behind metahumans, we see a lot of interesting things. Well, first of all, digital humans, and the word digital humans is interesting as well, uh, are a reflection of ourselves. They are designed so that we can learn through metahumans. So they are not only a representation of humans, but they are so realistic that we can use them to better understand ourselves. Um, Massimo was talking earlier about the fact that we, can, we could have some fake faces going around. Well, for example, metahumans could be such technology because, uh, of course, if your face is exactly like yourself, then you can try your dress or anything you want, a pair of glasses, for example, and you can buy it on your metahuman face instead of your real face. Indeed, digital humans are considered one of the fundamental building blocks of many technologies of the future. So they are not mainly a representation, some, something which is realistic, but they are a technology which is made to be part of, of further technologies. Uh, what is extremely interesting is the fact that MetaHumans was created uh, and is specific because its database was uh, all based on 3D scanning of real humans. And they call these actual real plausible human faces uh, so that it is important that they are believable. So uh, interestingly enough, when we think of the, when you look at the history of CGI, uh, new uh, the technologies beyond metahumans are very like what Massimo Leone in the latest entry of Lexia was describing as the difference between painting and photography. So we had realistic CGI long before metahumans and 3D scanning, advanced 3D scanning. However, uh, the indexicality given by 3D scanning and so on is allowing for a radical shift in realism which is very similar to the difference between paintings and photography even more interesting uh, the creators of metahumans they are not interested in the fact that metahumans sh should not look digital they want a pleasant looking digital character so digital humans may be naturally looking even though they are digital so they don't care about the uncanny valley here of course, they care about the fact that such faces must not be disturbing, but they don't care about the fact that such faces have to be true. So when we make a brief analysis of the clip that we have seen and these kind of quotes from the creators, we see a lot of interesting things. First of all, MetaHuman's faces wants to cover the wall aspects of the face. We have one of many, I, can, I could be one of many, so there is intersubjectivity. Metahuman faces look like other faces. They may look like your friends, 
like your sister and so on, or they be maybe very different from the people you know. But at the same time, I could be the one, they say. So there is subjectivity, there is the idea of the uniqueness. So they do not have types in a certain sense, but they are tokens, they are unique, they can represent subjectivity. Uh, another point important is that they say, you create the narrative, I am the metahuman. It is clearly anti physiognomy So any face can mean anything. This is extremely interesting. Any face can have behind any kind of history. There is no more this idea of a natural correlation between face. So this is, of course, an ideological value, utopic value of the face. Similarly, when we look at the video, the, what occurs in the video, we see that an old man becomes a young woman. So there is the fluidity, nomadicity of identity, which I thank Christina Voto for uh, helping me understand that, uh, for example, Rosie Braidotti was working on this idea already in 2012. So once again, we have deep values of the fact that any face can become any other face. Finally, we see that there is a, no more distinction no more opposition between the virtual and the real, because the real is actually the base on which the virtual is created. And at the same time, the virtual is used so that we can really understand faces. So I will call this a form of phenorealism. Sorry. Uh, secondly, uh, it is interesting to understand what are the historical roots of meta -human. So we have a kind of cultural shift about what I will call a digital habit toward faces and a kind of technological shift, which depend on the increasing processing power, highly definition of cameras, 4K, 8K, 16K, and AI. So from the point of view of the cultural habit toward digital, it all started actually in the 90s. So realism cannot be separated from familiarity. And we have been exposed to digital faces on a daily basis in mass culture almost from 30 years now. It all started in the 90s. One of the first movie uh, was Terminator 2, but 1995 Toy Story, this is a cartoon reboot, 1996, and 1997 Final Fantasy VII, uh, which uh, is uh, from an historical point of view, extremely interesting exactly for the shift to a photo photorealistic CGI. This implies a kind of epistemic degradation uh, which is extremely interesting because it is not something new. So this is a spot from 1999 made not, uh, uh, not by coincidence, by PlayStation, in which there was this, this girl. And it was one of the first photorealistic CGI uh, of head deformation which was made. And what is extremely interesting is that already in 1999, people could not distinguish if such face was true or not. And they went actually looking for her because they believed that such girl existed and they wanted to met her. However, of course, it was nothing real, but it, it all started to think, we all started to worry a lot about the fact that we could not really recognize a true face from a digital face, a true face from a fake one. And this all started in the late 90s. And this is, it is in this term that I use the concept of epistemic degradation. A consequence of this is a linguistic consequence. There is something extremely interesting in the fact that there have been a cultural shift in the language we use. We do not talk, or at least uh, talk very less, about digital characters or avatars. If you think about it, it was like one of the main words, one of the main keywords, think also of the movie. But we are talking more and more about digital humans. So we are shifting our conception of what those digital beings are, are to us, basically. Uh, even if you see here on the, on the left, Unique, which is, a, which is a software of chatbots, which have a face and they are actually, they have a huge success and they are called digital units. But a cultural shift could not occur without a technical one. And from this point of view, we still, everything still begins in the 90s and then continues in the 2000s, as uh, Simon Arcani teaches us, with the first good algorithm of face detection and face recognition. So basically, in these 30 years, what is extremely interesting is that there has been a project. Here you, you can see the quotation from the director of R&D at Unreal Engine. Unreal Engine is the engine which allows metahumans to work. And it was from 2018. And 
uh, over the last 10 years, they have worked a lot on facial animation. And their point is that if I can tell whether or not this character is lying, then we have won. So lying become the capacity of understanding lying is the main thing about the face being true. It is the main uh, scientific and technological aim. It is not a philosophical one. Uh, all, it all started probably in 2001 with Final Fantasy Spirit Within, which was a terrible, which had a terrible reception, but was the first movie with fully made actors. It came from video game from Square Enix, the makers of Final Fantasy VII, I was uh, mentioning before. And you also have in 2011, Alien Noir, which was a digital game, which was all about reading digital, uh, reading, uh, digital faces. What occurs now, if you look at uh, the, the modern contemporary technology, is that we have automatized this kind of reading. So we have highly uh, definition cameras, which are coupled with AI algorithms, often made with deep learning, so that the digital faces, we are, you have almost no mediation from the human in recreating the digital faces. The human is doing little work, let's say. And this is a, really something which is revolutionary from a technical point of view, because before making even a single face, uh, could imply months and months of work, like a painter, and of course a very high budget in money. But nowadays it is no more like this. So here is the question of my talk of today. At the light of all this, can metahuman faces be defined as false or fake? Are there meaningful differences between Pinocchio's face and the one of digital humans? So we cannot answer this question without choosing a perspective. And we have two main perspectives. The first one is the biological one. I use here the wonderful book from Jacques Monod, Le Hazard et la Nécessité, he is a Nobel winner, uh, in which uh, biology is understood in terms of what is in random in some part and necessary in the philosophical meaning, of course, in another. On the other hand, we have the, the, the semiotic perspective about the idea that lying and signs are uh, very hard to tell from if something is true or something is false. This is an entire project which was created by Umberto Eco. Uh, so from the point of the biological point of view, you can say that metahuman fate, fate for face to be real, it must have a certain numbers of bones, with certain characteristics, certain muscles, certain nerves. Even more importantly, they must be developed in a certain way. We know that the face, of humans uh, is developed in the womb of the, of the women we at a certain number of months and around the filtrum, which is this part of our, our face. So when we look at how uh, digital faces are made, which I worked on in the last week, also thanks to Roberto Gamboni, member of faces who helped me. Uh, well, they are of course, nothing like that. You have a geometrical shape, which is a set of mathematical point in space on which you apply a texture, which is an image, basically. And even though such image can have, as you see, the, for example, on the skin on the last right picture, uh, several levels of details, they are called. Well, actually, it's only one level. So one level. So for example, if you work on a wrinkle, uh, you can work on the wrinkle itself. In reality, a surgeon will work on the underlying muscle behind the wrinkle. It will not act on the wrinkle itself, so not on the surface of expression in semiotic terms. This is why a lot of bugs and glitches in the digital games are extremely interesting, because they show the fact that such faces are not real, that they belong to another kind of ontology. There are some, somehow empty faces. There is, however, another semiotic, uh, another perspective, which is a semiotic one, and which is related to the fact, I quote you, Massimo Leone, that the conundrum of artificial face is that there are no natural face, yet there is no face that it is also not natural. So the problem with the first perspective, of course, it is bounded to the idea of what is nature, of naturality. And semiotics, since Roland Barthes, 1957, mythology, semiotics started by doubting about the idea of the very idea of nature, what was natural. So uh, even more importantly, uh, Massimo Leone explains that artificiality cannot be the property of an object for semiotics. It must be the result of a relational condition and I had of an interaction. Finally, one of the, last, of the latest and last uh, writings of Peirce before his death uh, changed his idea of what the habit was 
by saying that a true world B, which means something which is potential or which is virtual, we will say it's not the same thing, but is as real as an actuality. So I will start from this to offer a definition of what a real face is and should be for semiotics. A real face is any face looking thing which is able to reproduce the full complexity of the experience that we have every day by interacting with the faces of all others in a variety of situations and from a multiplicity of purposes. With the complexity of the experience being directly related to the multiplicity of meanings that a face can be endorsed with. Therefore, a semiotically real face is any meaningful face looking surface of expression which is able to trigger an effect of reality by enacting all the habits that its interpreter has developed towards faces during his life. So from this perspective, uh, if we look at the two pictures on our right, uh, we see a form of composite portrait, which was completely false. It was a, an old technique of, uh, let's say, photo manipulation. While in the bottom, we see a real thermography of a man. However, we have no kind of habits, or at least very few habits, toward the bottom picture. It is almost impossible for us that this say that is intu intuitively a real face, that it is not made on a computer, for example. On the contrary, it is astonishing for us to discover that the pictures uh, on the top is not real, is not a real face. So basically, if a face it can capable of giving first impression, if there is an emotional agency, for example, that if a face is sad, then we feel sad too. If we can fall in love with the face, if we can intuitively uh, misread the feelings and thoughts of someone, so the prediction, and if their physical features can make us naturally recognize the traces of both subjectivity, the fact that it is a person, and intersubjectivity, the relation with this person with other person, then such faces are not realistic in the terms of deception, but they are so because there is something non-artificial in our relation with them. So we will choose the semiotic perspective, but I really want to point out that this is not because I want to deny, uh, like semioticians sometimes do, that nature exists and biology uh, is important. Of course, they exist, of course, they are. But meta-human faces, they are cultural artifacts designed for communicative purposes. So semiotic is a good choice. And more importantly, our objective research is understanding the relation between the fact that we can read the face as a lying face um, and the correlation between a lying face and a real face. So we have to understand what are the interpretative processes guiding our experience. So we have four questions and in the last 10 minutes, I will try to uh, explain them all about what is this experience of a face? So first of all, we have to understand what is a face looking thing from my definition. Uh, which is related to our brain. Secondly, all meta-human meta -human faces are made. So do they present, for a semiotic perspective, the necessary elements for semiosis to occur? Thirdly, what are those phenomenological and sociological habits of the face experience, which makes them real? And finally, what is the impact of the mathematical transduction of meta-human faces in our interpretation of them? because 3D scanning and all these technology, they are making mathematical transduction of our perceived reality. So from the point of view of a face looking thing, I will say that a face looking thing is something that our brain intuitively recognize as a face. And we, this intuition is extremely interesting for a semiotic perspective uh, because it has an, um, a very highly rated degree of trustability. We trust our sense, we trust our perception, even if they trick us many times. So this is from the point of view of the consciousness, of course, as semioticians, we're interested in the fact that if uh, a face meets the basilar cognitive properties to recognize face, then they are, uh, at least at the beginning, true faces. And from this point of view, of course, meta-human faces are true faces because even objects are able to trigger and to convey very complex uh, cognitive, uh, let's say, bias that we have uh, toward not only to recognize a face as a shape, but even to give a personality to the object, such as the one you see on my left picture. What is even more interesting is that we have an equivalent of this in purse, in the idea of a belief. For perf, a belief is an habit which may be precognitive, so may be, relation, may be related to cognition, which we do not know that we have. So uh, this is exactly how false positive of pareidolia works. 
we discover that we are made, genetic, genetically made to discover faces when we encounter the first positive of pareidolia. Before such things, we do not even know that we know what is a face. So this is perfectly a Persian belief. Finally, uh, from the cognitive point of view, another important thing is that the face must be able to trigger our mirror neurons. So some kind of empathic, let's say, uh, mechanism for which we tend to simulate the face of other and simulate the feelings of other through this kind of simulation. This was discovered in 2008 already by Professor Jacoboni. And although the, the question of empathy is extremely complex and cannot be reduced to a mere neurological process, actually, when we look at this experiment, they were made with very simple pictures. And once again, we have no reason to doubt, at least theoretically, that metahuman faces can produce such kind of effects. So now that we have understood the cognitive basis are all met, we have to ask if the semiosis basis of meaning are met. And yes, they are. Uh, I have spent, as I was telling you the last weeks, understanding how metahuman faces are made. And for a semiotician, which is extremely interesting, it's to see that from their design, the very beginning of the design, they are made a system of differences. So what you see on your, uh, on your right is called the face topology. It is the way in which you have different structures of uh, geometrical structure, let's say, that will shape the face and that will identify different areas of the face. And on your left, you see how the system of expression of metahumans can be coded through a system of differences. It is almost like the traits that we know in uh, linguistics, of course. Uh, not only that, but we also know that there are two values actually of relation, not only in a positive one, but also one of participation as Claudio Paolucci teaches us. And from this point of view, also, we see that uh, metahuman faces are deeply related to intersubjectivity for the very simple fact that, uh, as Umberto Eco was saying, they are made by what was made before them, by all the traces of other human being. So they only live as a collection of other signs, which makes a new science. This was also interesting because uh, in, his, in her book, Lillian Morrison of 2009 was inquiring the first technique of face recognition. And it, it was also exactly the point that we understand what the face is only through the difference and its relation with other faces. So semiotic bases also are met for metahuman faces to be recognized as real faces. So then we have the what I call the phenomenological and sociological aspects. So what is interesting here, what you see on your left is a picture of the most realistic CGI in digital games in the 90s, while on your left, on your right, sorry, you have the 2021 face of metahumans. What you see here is a leap in the quantity of information, which become a qualitative leap in the aspects of our phone experience. So we can recognize more things which are literal, which makes literally a face. The more the details, the more the data, which from a semiotic perspective are nothing more than information, uh, actually they make, the, they make the phenomenological experience of the face. Not only that, but there is a direct, direct uh, re relation between the quantity of information and the sociological aspect, aspects of the face. Uh, indeed, the fact that the face can be imbued, attributed meaning, social meaning, that the face can be deemed as worthy or not worthy, trusty or not trusty, and so on. The fact that they have, we have some idea of beautiful faces and not beautiful faces. All these things depend at the at their very core on the quantity of information. So this is, was really the point of the highly defi definition of new cameras, allowing for such kind of information, which in semiotics terms allow for semantic ambiguity. We can give a lot of meaning, and we are not sure of these meanings, even though they can be, uh, and, and they are, socially created. Finally, the last point is about the fact that for a face to be true, uh, we do not have any access to the mathematics of the world. We do not have any kind of neutral access. This is what the cognitive studies have proven us. There is nothing such as neutral perception of the world, a lot of experiment and so on. And the face, of course, is no exception. Indeed, still in the first technique in the 90s, the first and the better techniques of the face recognition, uh, it was directly proposed that face recognition in humans works like a form of deduction, like a form of guessing. 
So a real face must be guessed, guessed more than it is perceived. We know this very well by the simple fact of how many times we look different in, our, in, in different pictures. Um, this is because, of course, what is the real picture of our face? Is any of these pictures false, uh, any of these pictures true? It is a mere, merely a question of our perception of our face, of our habits, or, of our seeing us every day changes our idea of our own face. And on this point, I worked with a dear friend of mine, which is a surgeon, an aesthetic surgeon on the face. And she told me a lot of interesting things about this point. So one of the main issues that she has when working is that, first of all, before the surgery, people, they don't know, they don't really know their face. They have seen it all their lives, so they think that they know it. But actually, for example, they think that they are symmetrical, while actually human faces are not symmetrical at all. Secondly, after the surgery, uh, sometimes patients may say, well, but my, my face was different uh, before. And then she, she shows the picture and actually the face was exactly the same, of course. Uh, but by looking every day in a different way at, at our faces, we began to change our perception of how we perceive ourselves. Finally, there have been a lot of legal issues about the unreliability of computer generated projection, you know, like before, after, because people was looking at the computer and the mathematical version of their faces, and they were hoping to look like this. But not only the face is organic and may react not always as wanted, but also the kind of representation, mathematical representation of a face has nothing to do with our real life representation uh, of a face. This is why, in some sense, the GAN uh, uh, produced face are easy to trick us because they are not faces at all. They are still non-moving images of our face. While the face, and it is one of the main issues for space recognition software, is something which escapes singular recognition, which is changing, which is uh, existing in a lot of different contexts. However, meta-human faces, since they are made, uh, since they are made to be used in 3D words, and there are a lot of contexts. You can be closer to a face. You can see it from different perspective under different lightings, uh, when it's raining, when it's wet, when it's not wet, and so on. So uh, we can say that uh, liability becomes a truth criteria for the face, but not because we are actually able to read the face, but because we are easily mistaken the readings of our face. This is also what psychological experiment are proving about our capacity of detecting lies, for example, in children and in many other occasions. The point is not that a true face must be read. It is that we can mistakenly read a face. So we must have some elements. So to conclude, we see that we have four semiotic components of the face experience. Indexicality, related to the cognitive trust and semiotic belief. Relationality, the structural difference and the encyclopedic participation. Informativity, which makes what I call the phenorealism and the social realism. And finally, the interpretability about the fact that the face is deformed, is mediated, and we, is something that lies to us a lot of time, even if we don't want to, even, even if we don't think to. However, so uh, sorry, for this, from this point of view, meta human faces are completely real. We have actually almost no way of saying that they are false faces. The difference um, comes when we go from the level of the expression of the utterance from the level of enunciation. Here we understand that the true difference between, from a semiotic perspective, between uh, a real human face and a digital face because, uh, comes from the difference between the virtuality, the potentiality, and the actuality. So basically, the point is that um, meta-human face, since they are mathematical, they can have any kind of possibility. So they can endorse the value, the utopy that we have seen in the video. However, true faces, our, may, our faces which are made of lace, they cannot mean anything. They cannot do anything. We cannot, for example, have a smile if we are really sad. This is something which is not possible. However, for a meta-human face, it is completely possible. So for meta-human faces, there is no difference between the virtuality, which could be abstractly possible, and the potentiality, what is concretely possible. However, for meta-human faces, uh, such difference, uh, for human faces, such difference is fundamental in defining the identity of our face. So 
Mm, this is the thanks photography for all the people who helped me uh, with, uh, with this, Roberto Gamboni, Cristina Voto, Marco Viola, and Simona Centorbi. And this is the bibliography, and I thank you very much for your attention.